And three. And two. And one. Ah! Fucker. Did that wrong. Uh, that my thing. All right, here we go. And three, and two, and one. Sunday, March 22nd, 2020. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea. I just serve it. And that makes me Gary. Don't hurt nobody with your bad self. And welcome to Comes Out Loud, the Bear Podcast with Indeterminate Links, episode number 547. And we have with us the lovely and talented... Did Edward Angelina Cook. Yay! Yay, yeah, so happy to be here. Yes. Uh, hey. For those of you who are, are not patrons or late to the lab show, uh, we just finished talking about Broadway HD. If you want to hear that entire conversation, you become a patron. <laughs> just saying. Right there. Um, <clears throat> in any case... Besides being on our pedestal, and we just love having you because you're such a cool person uh, on the show, Gary. What is the other reason why we have uh, a, uh, Professor Edward here? Although it's probably not officially Professor, but you know what I mean. So the reason that we're having uh, Ed back is because we're continuing our series on the landscape of relationships, which was an idea that came about uh, last year, uh, based on a presentation that I had gone to. So, uh, but there was so much content to cover, we decided to split it up into a few episodes. So this one, we're going to talk about communication. What? Huh? I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about how you two fuckers need to be better at what you do. Wow. <laughs> See, it's what happens when you think you're being smart with me. <laughs> I call you out. <coughs> Speaking I mean, of such I, things, I, I did, I did uh, uh, post, uh, uh, get the get the uh, COLDR post ups uh, without your help, so we're good. Yay! I guess. Anyway, communication, Edward. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, so, so before we begin, uh, sorry, Ed, there's a disclosure apparently that needs to be said in this case, because uh, honestly, um, I didn't quite read the whole document, but right at the very top, we need to let everybody know that communication is important and vital in our relationships, not just open relationships. True. Duh. Duh. Yeah, yeah. It also says that as part of the disclosure. No, I know, duh. but that's where I wanted Ed to say the duck because I was kind of like, I'm hoping people are going to walk away from this and think we're only talking about open relationships. Like, right? Um, yeah. So, like, do I mean, do, do do people think that communication is only important for an open relationship and not for closed? I'm confused by this. Well, I think that, like, you know, when we were coming up with the topic um, that, you know, as far as the landscape of relationships go, um, you know, we have been talking a lot about, like, you know, open relationships. Um, and so, like, when we talk about communication, um, you know, like, it's really vital uh, with open relationships. Um and such, but that doesn't mean that it's not important <laughs> in other relationships as well. Um, like in my experience, uh, people who are in open relationships tend to have better communication skills 
um, than people in uh, not open relationships because they kind of have to. They kind of have to talk about things. That's fair. That's a fair assessment, I think. In some ways, not every, you know, but like a good balance because open relationships essentially are all about like making sure that each person kind of understands what the other person wants in regards to I'll use the word the term extracurricular activities that are involved um, mm -hmm. yeah so it's always good to have that information and communication is kind of key to that yeah so I mean I think yeah so I think it's important that like and also communication is uh, is also vital in other kind of relationships. So like business relationships with your friends, with your family, you know, like this is a tool that is going to be needed in all different in, in all of the aspects of the landscape of relationships, romantic or not. So what you're saying is that my team needs to communicate more. It would be. I've right. been saying Thank this to them for I don't know how long. <laughs> well, yeah, communication is key. Cool. So, um, also before <laughs> kind of we we begin, I want to. Uh, give a because we're going to be talking about our feelings and our behaviors as well. So I wanted to kind of preload our discussion with the cognitive triangle. Um, yeah, absolutely. So if you make a triangle with your with your hands, right at the top, we have our feelings up here, um, and our feelings um, impact how we think and how we uh, uh, how we think and how we act. Um, our thoughts over on the left hand side, the bottom left. Um, so our thoughts impact how we feel and how we act. Uh, and our behaviors over on the bottom right hand corner uh, impacts Wait. how we feel right. and how we think. Hmm. And the other thing that's important is as far as our feelings go, we really don't have any control of our feelings because they are um, they are a stimulus from our environment, right? Um, so like when people say like, oh, you need to control yourself, right? I'm like, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so we really don't have that much control as it comes to our feelings, but we do have control over our thoughts and our behaviors to most, in most, in most uh, situations. Mm -hmm. Fair. Right. Like sometimes our sometimes we have automatic thoughts and mm -hmm. our you know, mm -hmm. like when so if I were to say Mary had a little Lamb. Penis. Lamb, right? Pop. Little <laughs> oh <my God>. penis. <laughs> um because we like we've been conditioned that that is the end of that phrase, right? Like so we have an automatic thought about oh. that. Or I didn't hear that. Sorry. Oh. Oh. There we go. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> From Who Frames Roger Rad Rabbit. Well, in various Hard other safe. places, but but the the whole thing where you do part of it. Anyways. So uh, so yeah so like the 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 thought was that oh I have to finish that. The behavior was the clap clap. Or. Two bits. Two bits. <laughs> All right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Because um, that's going to be important because a lot of our communication um, is impacted by our feelings, our thoughts, and our communication is a behavior. So we want to make sure that um, we're recognizing that our communication is impacted by things and her thoughts. Mm. So I have a question for you, Ed. Um, is this expected to be like an equilateral triangle? Because this concept of feelings, thoughts, and behaviors isn't foreign to me, but I've never thought of them like in sort of a two-dimensional shape or even three-dimensional. Like, 
I always thought of them in terms of like a f- pattern of flow. So like there's, if you've ever seen it, there's like a very uh, frequently quoted concept, which is like your feelings beget your thoughts, your thoughts beget your behaviors, your behaviors become your actions. You know what I mean? Like it's this whole concept of like where things come from. Like, and if you're aware of your feelings in the very beginning, you can therefore change the outcomes. Yes. So uh, to me, it's always been kind of like a funneling or like a flow pattern as opposed to like a triangle because the triangle to me indicates that thoughts affect feelings and behaviors behaviors affect thoughts and feelings feelings affect thoughts and behaviors do you know what i mean like so that's where i was like hmm so um we're gonna have where so yeah that's a really good point and we're gonna get into that because sometimes how we think is going to impact how we feel right because like a lot of like anxiety a lot of depression comes from our thoughts Mm -hmm. Hmm. Does that make sense? And like sometimes when things happen, we have a um, or sometimes because of something which we'll talk about. But uh, like if you do something shitty, right, I'm going to have a feeling because of that or behind that. But we're going to talk about the fact that like the the importance of uh, responsibility of your feelings. Mm. And we'll talk about that. But yeah, like uh, we have to be mindful of our feelings because, yeah, they will influence our thoughts. They will influence our um, that that linear progression that you said. Okay. Yeah. So like um, a lot of that is coming from uh, cognitive theory and behavioral or cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, <laughs> not to be confused with cock and ball torture for those who at all know the other one <laughs> yeah every time right. i see that or hear hear somebody say that not in the regular context i'm first thinking wait, wait what and then i'm like oh no or from my background cbt is computer-based training so yeah. that's always fun when you're writing materials <laughs> and you keep writing out cbt 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 and then and but, then you're just like gigging in as you go along well, right, and then you're like, you know, for the kink folk out there, bop, gotta, gotta, <laughs> gotta rearrange the brain. I know, my first day of grad school, uh, I was doing some reading, and they were talking about CBT, and I was like, um, I don't think that means what I think it means. <laughs> <laughs> um, this yeah. is an acronym for something else, too. Exactly. Um, so... Uh, just kind of going from there, uh, you know, the things that I have to talk about are different kind of communication traps, uh, different kind of communication styles, and then Mm -hmm. a communication model called, called nonviolent communication, um, that Mm -hmm. I use in treatment with others. And I spent, uh, uh, kind of large majority of last night revisiting it and, uh, going, oh yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> um, so I'm actually kind of jazzed to, um, to talk to my clients about this. Ooh. Uh, so, um, so Damon, do you know the, do you know the musical Matilda? Um, I don't know the musical, but I kind and I kind of know the movie a little bit, but it's been a long time, but I know it's out there. Okay, cool. Well, there's this one song called quiet. And in Quiet, Mm -hmm. Matilda, um, who's awesome, says, um, have you ever wondered what I have about how when I say, say red, for example, the way of knowing if red means the same thing in your head as red means in my head when someone says red. Hmm. Right? Right. um, That kind of made me think about the, the assumptions that we make about other people's definitions about specific concepts um, that I need to be really sure that we're on the same page when it comes to different topics. Fair, yeah. Because um, I could be, uh, we, we might we might be talking about the same thing only on in two different books, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so like, so I, I, I put down some, some, what I consider like slippery words. So like, 
I may have a different definition of what it means to communicate, uh, what intimacy is, what trust is, what closeness is, what sex is, what passion may be, what fidelity is, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, like, if, if I think that fidelity is, um, like, you're supposed to uh, be my everything, um, and, and, and my definition of fidelity is that like, no, <laughs> no. you, uh, like I take care of my own needs. You take care of your own needs and we have shared needs. Um, and then like what love is, what commitment is right. So it's really important that we are being specific of these things. So like when you say trust, what are, what's your definition of that? Or What's your definition of intimacy? Fair. I say it like that, but yeah, that's kind of the thing. Like if, again, because we're dealing with people and humans and your cognitive triangle of like, you know, there are certain feelings and, and thoughts and behaviors around those words as well that um, could change, not necessarily, or, or change the definition for certain people. You don't know their history or their story. And for some Trust may be a, an awkward word, if that makes sense. You know, for example, trust could be an awkward word because it's the, do you trust me? And it's someone that ended up hurting them mm -hmm. kind of a situation. You know, that's just something that they maybe have difficulties with trust. So, yeah, like um, uh, to also frame that as like loaded. So like some words are really loaded. So they have... Um, you know they have a lot of things within that right so like mm -hmm. like trust is definitely like what is your history of trust right mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. what is your history of sex because for some people sex equals pain right mm -hmm. it's always a pleasurable experience for people sure so i say i want to have sex with you um if i have a negative experience with sex is that could say i want to hurt you mm-hmm Wow. Gary is thinking. Yeah. I can see it. <laughs> well, my brain is fucked up. And immediately, <laughs> as soon as Ed said that last part, uh, Culture Club popped into my head. I really so now I have Boy George saying, do you really want to hurt me? <laughs> Which I'm interpreting as, like, do you really want to fuck me? Or have, like, have sex with me? Because sex with me. So, yeah. <laughs> now it's got to be rethinking the whole song but anyways right so like so that's just a uh you know that i mean and i definitely encourage maybe uh even um i mean one of the things that i tell my my couples to do is to have two hours a week where you talk about like purposeful talk right so we're talking about something and that can be one of the topics right we're going to talk about intimacy right what does intimacy mean for you? What does it mean for me? Where's the overlap and where do we, like, where aren't we meeting, right? And how can we mm. find some there? Um, and one of the suggestions that I put in the recommendations um, is ways to build intimacy with your partner. Um, that is a really fun activity. Um, and it's uh, this tool called uh, 36 questions um to fall in love mm. uh, the 36 questions that lead to love so it's a new york times article and um the questions increase in intimacy and they're in three sets um so as each question is asked it's getting more personal and more um probing and it ends with a four minute eye gazing activity um, and research has shown that the more that you uh, increase your eye contact, the more connection, the more attachment that you were you will build with that other person. Mm. Hmm. Okay, that's good. That, uh, like thoughts. you know, all of these things are. It's a lot of fun, and it's it's also something really good to do with friends. You know, if you want to if you want to develop that intimacy with people that you're close to, like ask these questions. Um, 
because you'll be really surprised about the answers that you get and it'll help you know the people in your life better. Mm. <laughs> As I go and look at this article. <laughs> Right. So I think like the first question is like, um, uh, if you can invite one person to dinner alive or dead, who would it be and why? So that's rather, you know, um, impersonal, right. Mm -hmm. With some kind of levels of personality. But then the last question is what is, I think like, what is something that you wish that, um, like tell me a a problem that you're having and how I can help with that. I think that's Mm -hmm. the last question. If yeah, you're a personal that, problem, ask your partner's similar. advice on how he or she might handle it. Also, ask your partner to reflect back to you how you seem to be feeling about the problem you have chosen. Mm. And that's gonna come, that's gonna go into like the the tools that I'm going to uh, talk to you about um, because empathy is super important, right? And like reflecting back to the other person how you think that they're feeling or how you're uh, like sensing that they're feeling, that's the definition Mm -hmm. of empathy. Mm -hmm. Like being present with another person. Yep. Um, And the other, so like one of the other things that's really important is that uh, we're not, we're not really taught how to communicate. We're not taught how to do many of these things that we're going to talk about. We just assume that the other person lives in our concepts of understanding (laughs) <laughs> but our understanding are informed by our uh, society that we grew up in, our family that we grew up in, all of our experiences, um, our, you know, our trauma, um, our like all of our lived experiences, and you know, it's not, yeah. um, it's not fair to just make assumptions about that the partner knows what red means for you. Uh, when red can mean something completely different for me. So this last part that you were talking about, Ed, I think is like, not only is it key to like relationships, like intimate relationships, but it's just key to communication period in a broad scope, because like we presume any person we meet on the street, as the saying goes, that they understand Mm -hmm. where I'm coming from and what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. So, but that's not always the case. Like we see it, all the time and that's usually where there's a spat or like an argument a disagreement like something like they're just not on the same page exactly and so there's the because i think of that you know in terms of like when people are out and about although to be fair since things have begun uh quite recently with COVID 19 um and like people being out in public and like self-quarantining and you know, social distancing and that kind of stuff. I don't see as many people getting pissy and angry, which I find very interesting. Um, But I would see, you know, like people just like kind of snapping. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's one of the things that like I I know of, you know, is that there's, there's a couple of factors that are going on in like training that I used to do. There's a key difference between um, listening to respond and listening to understand, Mm -hmm. you know, listening to respond is about, you can't wait for the other – you're just literally waiting for the time when the other person stops communicating so you can communicate mm-hmm. what you have to say, which means you are not engaged. You are actually being disrespectful like, and you're disregarding the other person because you have something that you want to say. And so it, it's a learned thing. Like It takes time to work with and I'm by no means a master of it even though I've trained it to hundreds and hundreds of people, you know. That you be present in the moment and you actually wait for the other individual to finish and you take into account what they say mm-hmm. before you, you know, respond at that moment. So, yeah, it takes a while. But I think that's really important, you know, that we make huge presumptions about people's backgrounds, like that they understand things. I know in my last relationship, like that was the thing that he had said to me. He was like, you, you act and behave like I know what's in your head. He's like, that is, that is not the case ever. <laughs> mm. So, and I was like, oh, I know exactly what's going on in your head. <laughs> I was like, okay. 
Well, I mean, it's like, I mean, it was a huge learning lesson. I mean, we're still friends and it's like, I think about that every now and then because he basically was saying, you are kind of a Pandora's box. Like it is difficult to understand where you are and what you're thinking because of how you behave. Like you're making a presumption because you're in your head. Other people are also in there, like <laughs> knowing how you're thinking and feeling. So things are just matter of fact to you when in, when in reality they are not at all because I'm making yeah. a huge presumption. Well, I hope that, like, after uh, this, it will give you possibly some some new tools to use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, you know, I think one of the, like, that's why I said that. Like, this shit is hard. <laughs> like, this is not easy. And, like, when I was going back over this, I was like, oh, man, I've been doing that wrong, you know, or I've been like, I, I really haven't been communicating that well. Um, mm -hmm. I need to do a better job of communicating these concepts. Um, so yeah, like this, this is not easy. And like, it really takes a lot of mindful communication, right? Like mm -hmm. being really present with the other person and <laughs> like, yeah. just, allowing yourself to experience what they're saying right um yeah. without without criticism without judgment um and that is not easy because we're conditioned to evaluate all the time um and this is asking us like just don't do that <laughs> because it's not, that's not gonna well, help well, uh, <laughs> uh oh I don't know if I fully agree with the don't do it. I think it's I, I think there's a a, a natural uh, perhaps a biological like background like in why we as a species do it because we come from understandably like eons ago like conceptually about like fight or flight like is this moment something that's gonna like benefit me or hurt me like. And so I think like that's just a I think that's just an ingrained thing in terms of the the species like like you either work through and you modify yourself, but if that hasn't happened, then that's just the default. And I, I told no, I totally get that, and that's why I'm like you know these are these are conditioned responses. Um, but uh, when we evaluate or when we criticize things we're we're in no way going to have our needs met nor are we going to uh, be able to meet the needs of other people because right. criticism evaluation those are all um like that's what this model is talking about like violent language mm. right so like i'm not saying like don't do it because you're going to do it um but just be mindful that like when you do it, it's it, you're you're not going. You're more. You're less likely to get what you want, and you're less likely to help the other person get what they want too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, but again, like huge disclaimer that this is not easy, and this takes a lot of engagement. Um, and that kind of leads me. So, um. There is this uh, concept called the four, the four horsemen, and there's a, a relationship therapist, psychologist um, by the name of John Gottman. Um, and he, uh, through research and everything, he came up with these uh, four qualities or communication styles um, that are indicative of divorce. Um, and they are defensiveness, criticism, contempt, and stonewalling. Um, so contempt is the one that like I really struggle with, um, and contempt is just like um, what is contempt? <laughs> contempt is the feeling that um, a person or a thing is beneath consideration, worthless, or uh, deserving scorn. Mm. Right. So like. Um, and that's the thing, like the other, um, and the, the remedies for these are defensiveness is, um, uh, like listening, empathy, criticism is, um, like noting the positive. Mm -hmm. And stonewall stonewalling is, um, be, uh, open to like, well, stonewalling is, 
uh, being able to take breaks, right? Like recognizing that, hey, listen, we're, we're not in a place where we can really communicate effectively right now. So let's just take a five minute break and come back to this. Mm -hmm. um so like those are those are some uh like communication traps um that that when you fall into them it's really hard to get out yep Mm. um so some other ones like our extreme language so we want to make sure that we're avoiding language like always never um and also vague language like sometimes rarely um because those really aren't a specific yeah, or yeah. Um, like really like accurate representations of, of what is actually going on. Um, and then keeping score, you know, like <laughs> uh, that, I mean, that's something that I feel like I do a lot. <laughs> uh, but I, I know that some other two, well, I did this and, um, and, yeah, and no. I did this. Right. Um, but, it, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Um, it yeah. matters about like in that moment. That's one of my one of my personal biggest pitfalls is keeping score. Like I will own that right now. It's it's one of the big ones for me. <laughs> yep. I did and this, then, so you should be able to do that because I did this, and since I did this, are well, you did that, so now I have to do this kind of thing. Oh yep. yeah. Yep. 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 Make sure the scales are balanced. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's why I'm laughing because my brain is in a a messy place this morning, y'all. I apologize. (laughs) Because I was like, because you were like keeping score. And I was like, so what is that? Being like, like, hold up. I gave you head this morning. You owe me. Like, (laughs) (laughs) oh. Oh. It's not just that, but it was like that's what was like going through my head, and then David's like, "I am totally guilty of this." And I was like, "Oh no!" Like, just <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to know about this part of your relationship with Jim. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> "Motherfucker, I gave you a handy this morning." Like, <laughs> the least you could do. <laughs> hey, what mine, bitch? No, no, <laughs> no, no. Um, I mean, it's, is, I, it's, is it's two handies a, worth a blowjob, or are blowjob and oh handies like equal? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, that's well, like, what's the value of each type of of action? But that brings up an excellent point, though. Like, uh, Ed, is it fair to say that like those equivalencies are are per relationship, not universal? Of course. Okay. Yeah. Like, I mean, he, he, like, sometimes like some people just don't like hand jobs, and some people are some people don't want to get fucked. Like we all know this, we've seen this. They like like, but they like to get fucked, like you know, like or whatever. You know what I mean? But like, I'm not like, into anal, but you could eat my ass. Uh, <laughs> I think what you mean is you're not into insertion. There you go. I mean, there are other ways. Point. There are other ways to pleasure that spot. But right, but then it's like like, oh, but I have long fingers and you're fine with me trying to find your button, like and massaging <laughs> you from the inside. <laughs> Technically that's an insertion. Look, um, there's a difference between a <laughs> finger and a penis. Well, in some cases it's understandable. There are some big, thick penises out there in the world. I will just say that for the record. In case anybody doubted it. <laughs> So I could see I, the differential about a finger versus a penis going up there. Fingers, uh, you know, like big. Yeah. So in the live chat, uh, Ed, this is mostly for you. Lloyd asks, could contempt in a relationship be like unfocused regret? Unfocused regret. Well, I'm going to need an example or what, 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 what is unfocused regret mean? Okay. Um, yeah, because with us talking about the four horsemen, I think that that's where he was uh, thinking about that. It, it, maybe it's just like the sort, really more of like the source of where the contempt like, is from, but it's contempt nonetheless. Um. Oh. Huh. Um, regret. Like, I mean, could it be like this didn't happen? So. I'm feeling like entitled or I'm feeling I'm feeling so, bad because it didn't happen. 
So regret is a feeling of sadness, repentance, or disappointment over something that has happened or been done. Um, hmm. I'm very curious now as I'm like having this like I'm thinking trying to figure this out this unfocused regret I could see that being a thing but I also no, I, I don't think, know no I think I think so yeah like I'm thinking about like resentment mm-hmm. yeah that's what like I'm thinking having about. like a chip on your shoulder mm-hmm. yeah I think so. Yeah, I think I think that is an example of that. Yeah. Deserving scorn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they did this, I am entitled to treat them in a certain way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes All right. that, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. That can, uh, that can, that can make sense. Um can, I can see that uh, being an example of contempt. Um, mm-hmm. it's, <laughs> so, like, no. maybe, maybe what I would say for that is you would want to counter that with something that you do appreciate that they have done. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. So. One more time. So, like, communication styles, right? So, like, we have patterns of communication. We've all heard of these. Uh, So, like, passive and submissive, or passive or submissive. Um, So, that's, like, somebody who is constantly apologizing for everything that they're saying. Um, Mm -hmm. Like, a people pleaser. I have no experience with that. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, are you saying you don't have experience with pleasing people? With like with doing things in order to to please people, um, like you know, making sure that other people's needs are met before my own, um, mm-hmm. uh, like aggressive aggressive communicators. Like I would say, Fifi Fifi O'Hara is an aggressive communicator. <laughs> wow! <laughs> right. Um, Sorry. Only those two would understand that. Um, well, I'm gonna make I'm gonna oh, make a few so a, a few drag race references, um, like passive aggressive. Like that's the thing. Like where your where the what's coming out of your mouth is not reflecting what's on your face or your body language. So like I'm fine <laughs> is a really good I'm example fine. of that. I hate to say it, but I say that a lot, and I'm not. <laughs> I'm not 100% fine. Honestly, yeah. For me, it's a matter of, I don't want to, like, I don't want to go into it right now. I'm processing it in my own head. So, like, let me figure myself out first before I move forward with, like, getting it out to other people. Okay. Yep. Um, and then, like, so some people will also put, like, manipulative as a communication style, and to give an example, uh, on All Stars, on the last All Stars, when Gia Gunn went to Pheromone and was like, I want to know how you're feeling if this is your last day home or if this is your last day here, right? Like, she's manipulative. Yeah. <laughs> or she can be manipulative. And then also Fifi O'Hara um, can be manipulative as well. Um, so here's a question for you that I have because. I'm curious about something. And wouldn't other people just say that that's being aggressive? Uh, being like, uh, manipulative? Like it's a, yeah, like, that being manipulative is a version of being aggressive. I would say, uh, yeah, like that's why that's why I'm saying like some like some research or some people frame manipulative as a specific st- style um, that is separate from aggressive communication. Like um, I know that. So one thing that people do that bothers me is when the when they say, "Oh, you don't love me anymore." Mm. Because yeah. they want me to tell them that I love them. And that's just like really that's just shady. Yeah. Um super fucking shady. It's also kind of aggressive. Well, I mean it, it's definitively manipulative because 
it's a no win situation by putting that mm-hmm. out there. The other individual is backed into a corner expected to debate that or to refute yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Now, I guess there is an opportunity to agree to turn the tables like on the other individual, which sounds like something I would do in a communication style. Cause the moment I realize I'm trying to be controlled, I'm like, fuck you. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. so if Ed was to say to me, like, you know, I don't think you love me anymore. I'd be like, uh, you're not wrong. Cause at this moment that shit don't fly. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well, I mean, not like with that like, attitude. <laughs> shit. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's, that's the whole so thing. Right. But I mean, that's, that's I mean, the that... whole thing. Like, if, if someone's attempting to do these in their communication style and the other person is aware of it, like, I could see it being heated, but it also escalates in terms of, like, who has the power dynamic in the communication. Mm-hmm. Like, who's getting the up on the other person. Which yeah. is not what communication yeah. should be about, but that's what it's turned into, at least in yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah, you kind of you went right where I was going to talk about, like with the power dynamics, because like when somebody can make an aggressive comment, like the expectation is that they're going to take the passive role um, in response to that, right? But like, Mm -hmm. um, uh, and like you know, when I was doing this, I was thinking about even the goal in, well, so like the goal in any kind of communication is to be assertive, right? Making sure that you're expressing your needs and that you're. Uh, doing it in a way that is not hurting anybody else. Um, but like when I think about like BDSM and, and and kink and everything, like even when there are power dynamics, we I, I feel, and I could be wrong, but like they should come from an assertive place. Mm-hmm. I mean, depending on the power dynamic that's in place, usually the assertive one is the dominant like that's the and then the, which is the person that has get, been given power by the submissive so you know bdsm bdsm 101 like the 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 there's an agreed upon role play right right the sub the person who is taking the passive role essentially in this exchange has agreed to and I'm throwing that in there because it's important, has agreed to give power to the dominant or the, the assertive um, person. Therefore, that p- dominant person, um, words, that dominant person has taken on this power in the understanding that the passive or submissive is okay with it. However, to kind of throw another caveat on there, all of that all agrees on, you know, can be changed with safe words, um, you know, stopping a scene. The sub can still stop a scene right. or stop a moment because maybe you've gone past their threshold or maybe they're not okay with what you're doing next or you're talking about what you're going to do and then they can kind of like stop it. So, well, where. Right. So no, that's cut you off, Damon. But like one of the things I learned about like in, in scenes that I thought was like really helpful was about the gradation of communication. And by that, I mean like that there could be levels. So, yes, like most people are kind of familiar with the concept of a safe word, but you can actually do other things like you can talk yeah. about colors or mm-hmm. one of the things I really liked was instead of being verbal, you can give nonverbals like hand signals. So Mm -hmm. as an example, like, let's say that Damon is the dom in a flocking situation and the other person is like on the um, St. Andrew's Cross. Cross. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're like, you know, standing there, um, legs apart, like feet apart and, you know, arms apart, like a big X, so to speak. And they can use a hand to signal like where they are. So that the Dom is aware the whole time. So if he and Damon or they and Damon have communicated this and Damon knows that like when we get to all five fingers, like that's like, you know, where we are. If I get a fist, maybe this is where we stop. And like so the the Mm -hmm. amount of fingers can communicate like the level of where they are 
in the comfort. And when I found out about that, I was like, oh, that changes everything. Because I think a lot of people think in terms of like kink and BDSM that it's like an all or nothing. Like, Fair. And that's yeah. really not that's not true to the dynamic in most cases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really well. In in essence, the sub has has the power in in general. It, right, like and I think that's the thing that rela- people don't the BDSM understand. BDSM relationship is it sounds like the the dom is using the power that has been given to him by the sub. The sub can take that power away at any time based off of previously agreed signals, whether it's a safe word, some sort of like a gesture or, or uh, some other signal. Right. So it, it is a way of uh, communication. It's, yeah. <clears throat> sometimes yeah. it's nonverbal. And well, yeah, I guess that's, that's why I'm saying that like, um, like assertive communication is kind of the goal, even in um, BDSM dynamics, because yeah. you want to make sure that, that both of your needs are getting met. And you don't want to yeah. be like, you don't want to be passive, even if you are assuming the passive role um, or the sub role. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, um, because yeah, like in that kind of like, you want to let your Dom know that you are, you're reaching your limit, right? So, like, that's yeah. why I, yeah. I really like. So, you can be submissive with also being assertive. Yeah. So, I guess that's kind of the 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 point I was trying to make. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you can be aggressive um, with while being assertive. Yeah. Right, and I I think that's one of the things that takes. Uh, experience or familiarity like even if the experience is like observational as opposed to like being directly in it like in those moments in those scenes when things are happening um that you can you can see that there's there is that whole exchange and like that's the big thing that people may not understand that actually yes technically the submissive is the one that's in control Despite right. the fact that in the moment the Dom appears to be the one that is in control. Like yeah. that was probably one of the wisest things that I learned from the community was that actually everything's flipped, but you don't know that. Like as an outside mm-hmm. observer, you're just like, This, you know, Dom yeah. is big, powerful, brutal, like, you know, doing all of these mm-hmm. things. But if they're this is a horrible saying, worth their weight and salt, they're in like completely engaged in the moment of the scene and paying attention to everything that's happening with the sub Mm -hmm. because not all subs are good in communication style. Mm -hmm. So even if you establish something like be it hand signals, um, like verbal colors, you know, like Mm -hmm. a classics or, you know, red, yellow, green, um, Mm -hmm. you know, if they're, if they're not able to communicate that or they're forgetting to do that, you know, or something's going on, like the Dom needs to be, aware of that like check and yeah. basically check in you know because mm-hmm. yeah it's it's yeah so you know in a lot of ways like agreed like the, the to kind of I, I know we need to move on but like that's sort of a big thing like that's the thing i think the trick that most people don't understand like i can stand there with my flogger and beat the holy shit out of what are you scary because why not um <laughs> Because he is, like I can beat the ever loving shit out of Gary as long as he wants me to. But the minute he says no or stop or red or fist or whatever, like I should stop. Like I have to if I am a good dom. Yeah. If I am seeing the 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 signals and I'm looking at the signals, or if I'm looking at uh, looking at Gary. And Gary has gone off into his like like subspace, and he's not paying attention to anything, and he's seeing all the bright colors and everything else in the world around him. But he's getting hurt. Like we're not at the point where like oh like this is not that happy little medium. This is like oh we're we're we might be doing some damage. Like I need to pay attention to that because sometimes he may not be able to. He may not. He may be like I said. He may be gone like into that subspace. Um, I have met some, especially in my like experiences with vlogging, what have you, I've met people that they could go forever. I can break my arm and like, they could still want more. Like that's like, cause that's, they get that 
feeling and they're in that zone and they're good. Like, and they could mm-hmm. take a lot. But well, I have to also be attention to myself and be like, well, um, I'm going to I'm going to hurt myself if I keep going. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think so. that what we're talking about is really important in terms of like communication with anybody, especially in terms of relationships. I think what Ed's like Ed's pointing out in this case is like like there are all these different styles, but the reality is that the relationship hopefully develops its own, whichever it may be, a blend of these, like however that mm-hmm. is. So in the event that like it's not going well in that moment, that the individual feels empowered, that they can communicate in some fashion, like I'm not good or I don't like this conversation or I need like, you know, space or something mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. otherwise – that's where I think things can not only escalate, but become more damaging, even if unintentional, you know, because perhaps the partner is saying, you know, probing a lot and asking like, what's going on? You know, why are you upset? Whatever's happening. And the other person can't communicate it at that moment, you know? And so Mm -hmm. they're being aggressive in a caring and compassionate way, but they actually don't realize that they're pushing too hard, too fast or too, you know, whichever. You're your, Gary, your tone is very pointed right now. <laughs> no, now my tone is pointed. Um, so the um, so one of the challenges that I run into a lot, um, and this this uh, reminds me of. Uh, so I work with kinky couples, and sometimes um, their communication style can reflect their role in their relationship, and then also it could um, mirror. So, like, sometimes you could have a submissive um, in the relationship who takes on the aggressive communication style because they're not having their their needs met. Um, And that can really fuck up the dynamic real hard, real quick. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So, like, but then also they could adapt their communication style of their role. So, like, you know, they could uh, adapt a submissive communication style. Um, And then that way... They're not getting their needs met. And what happens when we don't get our needs met? We sometimes become aggressive. Mm. Right? So right, 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 right. Uh, yeah. So that's why, like, the goal is we want assertive communication. So, like, that kind of leads into the violent versus nonviolent communication. So violent communication we've talked about. So that is, like, the blaming, the criticism, the judgment, the stonewalling, contempt, and defensiveness. Nonviolent communication, um, that uh, where we're using empathy, collaboration, and freedom. Um, it also allows us to be seen, heard, and understood, which is everybody's basic needs. And then I have no idea what I put there, but um, <laughs> no idea what that was. But uh, the uh, the process of this are that we need to state our, like what we're seeing. So our observations, um, communicating our feelings, identifying our needs, values, and desires, and then making a request or an ask. Um, So that seems very simple, but it's a hell of a lot more complicated than that. Uh, So like with the observing, with the observations that we're making, when we're talking to somebody, we want to make sure that we're we're observing what happened without any evaluation or judgment. So I put in here to use uh, as an example, like reading and shade would be <laughs> um, an example of observing with an evaluation or a judgment. Does that make sense? Right. So what you're saying yeah. is to not do that. To not do that. There's a time and a place, you know, like when the library is open, go for it, right? But, like, sometimes the library can't be open all the time. <laughs> wow. um, Why and, you gotta be like that? I don't understand, Ed. That sounds very controlling. Um, your tone is very pointed right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not even, never mind, never mind, I'm gonna shut it down. <laughs> that was really funny. <laughs> Um, so that's why I'm saying like this, this shit is hard, uh, which is an evaluation (laughs) of this. Um, so the, the key to this is specificity. So we want to, um, make sure that we are, uh, saying what we mean and meaning what we say, uh, and that, uh, avoiding extreme and other 
descriptive words like always, never, really, unless they are actual observations. Um, but if they're not, you know, just yeah. be like, you know, you never, uh, uh, you never, um, you never call me versus, you know, this past week, you didn't call me. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's like um, extreme language versus like an actual observation. Um, so, but like, that's really hard because the problem with observations are that like, we evaluate and judge naturally, Gary, like you were talking about, it's like kind of part of our genetic code, um, because, uh, like evaluating something can keep us safe and judging something Mm -hmm. keep us safe. So like, this is not easy at all and it takes like this takes a lot of practice and i am not i am you know i am nowhere an expert on this at all um so as far as feelings go um i sent uh gary a a feelings inventory and a needs inventory because sometimes and men are more apt to do this we don't know how to express our emotions or we don't know how to communicate our, our emotions or our feelings because we're not socialized to do so. So the only emotion that we're like really able to, to communicate sometimes is anger. Um, mm. so, in, uh, so it's really important that we improve our feelings vocabulary. Um, and the inventory list that I, I sent Gary is a, um, a list of when your needs are being met versus when they're not being met. Uh, mm. And the other thing that I find that I do all the time, and, I, and I'm very hyper-focused on when people are doing this, is that they confuse feelings with thoughts all the time. So like, feel, like communicating your feelings is like, I feel sad, I feel hurt, I feel this, right? Communicating your feelings is not, I feel as though, I feel that, I feel you are, right? Those are thoughts. Mm. Mm. All the time. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm going to notice this now because there there was this girl in uh, grad school who every time she, she talked, she said, you know, I feel as though, <laughs> I feel as though. <laughs> Like, no, you think that. <laughs> I'm feeling that, like, this class is so fucking boring that I shouldn't really be here. Like, no. Sorry. <laughs> okay, Tiffany. Yeah. Go get Thank your you, diploma Summer. somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is April, like the month. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think, right, uh, like, people use words but don't. Uh, maybe do not understand Mm -hmm. like how the words put together don't communicate clearly do not communicate clearly so like the example that you were just giving a moment ago Ed, what was that again i feel as though right it's like well no like feelings are definitive (laughs) to say as though is to like fog it up you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like to make it unclear. Like, that's one of my pet peeves. When when I ask a question, and it's a close-ended question. So, if I was to ask Ed, do you like chocolate? Yes. See, that's, it's a yes or no. But if he responds open-ended and says, well, it depends on, no, bitch. It's yes or no. Like, it was very straightforward. <laughs> it's kind of like, do we have milk, do, honey? Do you like chocolate? Well, if no, 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 either we have milk <laughs> or we don't have milk. Like, I, it's one of my biggest pet peeves when you ask people a question and then, like, they decide to, like, give a longer answer. And I'm just as guilty. So I'm by no means, like, immune to this. But it's an awkward <laughs> thing about communication that people, like, they, they spin something and you're kind of like, no, 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 no. You know? Do, yeah. Do we have milk? Well, um, I mean, there's some milk in the fridge, but I don't know how long it's been there. And so, um, 
I mean, it might be good. What do you need it for? Like, are you wanting it for your cereal? Or do you want like like a quick like sip of milk because you need to take it with your medicine? Because I mean, it might be good for that. But like, if you need something for like <laughs> baking or something, like maybe you need some more. But like, we only have like some, like fuck that shit. Oh my God. <laughs> Well, if you're not sure if it's myself. spoiled, I would call that a, I'm not sure. I know <laughs> yeah, that's right, the fridge, right. but I don't know how long it's been there, so it may be spoiled, so we may not actually have them. And, and see, that's where, like, you could, but see, you could still answer directly and then put an addendum. Maybe? Like, you could say, yes, honey, we have yep. milk, however... Yes. Yes, we have milk, but we bought it in yes, December. But. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> like, like, that's right. We bought it. We bought it during Turn the holiday. Shit out, man. Because we're because yeah. we don't drink milk much. It may yeah. have actually soured. It would be yeah. great for like a, a bread starter or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, like, like we bought this milk in December. We might want to use it for cheese. Like, like, like something along those lines. Yeah. We're not, but it, it, it's probably not going to be good for. Consumption. Anyway, there, right. there, 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 I, I, I wouldn't use uh, naturally soured milk. I would use fresh milk and sour it yourself in order to make. Cheese. I'm, 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 I'm. I don't think milk. it would be a, be very good. <laughs> hey, um, Jeff, good use of using your feeling versus thinking words. <laughs> ah, not intentional. Yeah, well, like, ah. I, could, I could have heard you say. Um, I don't feel that would be good. But you said, I don't think that would be good. See, that was a thought versus a feeling. Good. You get an applause. Unintentional goodness. I don't know. Unintentional <laughs> goodness. Um, all right. So, like, this kind of moves into – so the reason why – one of the reasons why we do that is um, why we do I feel as though I feel that is work we're, we're uh, connecting our thoughts with our feelings. So um, we need to be sure that we are distinguishing between what we're feeling and how we think others are others react or behave around us. And um, I, I use the uh, the example of uh, Laganja Estranja saying, "I'm feeling very attacked." <laughs> Right. Just because you feel that way doesn't mean that that um, others are attacking you. I well, disagree. Yeah. OK, so, so I you can feel I, attack, but it doesn't mean that you're being attacked. Right. So um what you can say though is um, when this happens, um, like when you are saying this to me, I'm feeling scared because we are. Because uh, when we say I'm feeling very attacked, we're 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 having a thought that they are attacking us mm. when that might not be their intention, right? So we have to be sure that like we're identifying with our feelings. We're taking we're taking responsibility for our feelings, right? Um, but like this happens again all the time, is that we we are communicating our feelings based on what we think other people behave. So like one of the other example is I'm feeling very unloved by my coworkers um, because they don't include me. That doesn't mean that your coworkers mm. don't love you. <laughs> I mean, true. Right? Like it so like a more a more um nonviolent way to say that is I'm I'm sad when I'm not or when I'm not included by my coworkers, I feel sad. Yeah. When our coworkers right. don't include me and stuff. I don't um, like it. Yeah, but like, but Gary, I want to like. This is probably one of the biggest mind fucks of this um, model because it happens all the time, <laughs> and there are we have language for that, um, which kind of goes into my 
next point of like taking responsibility for our feelings. So have you ever heard the saying, um, uh, you can't make, you can't make other feel things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we say, um, you make me so angry. I've heard that. You made me do that. Mm. Heard it. Heard it before. Right? Um, Totally guilty. 100% guilty of that. Um, But, like, what this model is saying is that we're confusing the stimulus, being the feeling, with the cause, which is the need that we have. So, like, Mm. um, because this happened... Um, I have this feeling because it went against this need that I have. Right. So like, not that, um, because this happened, I, I reacted this way. Mm. So <clears throat> here's the thing I wanted to say, cause I've been listening to you, Ed, but I'm like stuck on something. Sure. Um, and identifying and expressing feelings, we were talking about that uh, when people say, I feel, you know, and they're not, you know, and they're they're kind of mixing up thoughts and feelings. And you had said that uh, that they're not actually being attacked. OK, so in the example, I'm feeling very attacked in your leg and they're not actually being attacked. That's where I had like a mental like kind of trip up because I was like, mm. To me, that's equivalent to yucking the yum. Like, you can't dispute a person's feelings. Like, there's, you have no grounds in that. How they feel is how they feel. And so their perception could be incorrect to what's actually happening in reality, but it is still their perception. Therefore, it is still real. Uh huh. Like, Unless I think of this in terms. Intentions are, aren't to attack them, but maybe is supposed to be just some sort of criticism or something right so really so what, I, what you're saying what he's saying is is i'm feeling scared like i'm being attacked where it's like i'm not sure if that's the intention is being attacked but i'm feeling scared and this is the reason why i'm feeling scared mm. right so the example you just gave uh jeff is the clearer communication mm-hmm but we don't do that. I think Ed's point is like we we phrase it in a way that isn't accurate. Like it was, we're we're kind of swapping ideas around. And the reason why this came up is I was thinking in terms of like mental health. Um, having recently attended like uh, mental health first aid training, one of the things that you would not do to a person who's having an episode is tell them that what they're what they're what they're experiencing isn't real. So if someone's having a schizophrenic episode is having hallucinations, um, you don't tell them that those things aren't real because you're not going to convince them otherwise. Like, you're going to dispute their reality. And so in that moment, as opposed Mm -hmm. to focusing on the falsehood, you acknowledge it if necessary, and then you move, like, in a different direction, if that makes sense. So... That was what was coming to mind Ed, when you were like, you know, when you say to them, you know, the, about how they're not being attacked. It's like, I understand what you mean that in reality they're not being attacked, but I wouldn't say to that person, or at least I would hope I would not say to them, you know, to dispute or to kind of argue. Am I making sense? No, you um, are. And, like, and yeah, that that isn't how I would respond to them, too. Like, um, you know, I don't know how. Uh, Laganja was responded to, but like if 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 she came to me and said, "I'm feeling very attacked," mm-hmm. I would say um, that um, the okay, why are you feeling attacked? Well, mm-hmm. because of the way that you're uh, the way that you're talking to me. Okay, so um, how does that like what feeling is that coming up for you, right? Mm-hmm. And what need is that is what need isn't being met for you in that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, okay, so you're actually scared because you need to be heard or you need to be validated or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. So um, you can recognize that I wasn't attacking you, um, but like this is what you were feeling. Like that is the actual feeling that you're having. Right. 
not the evaluation that you're making on my on my behavior. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but like this is re- like again, this is hard <laughs> because uh, and that's why like the mindfulness comes in because sometimes it's really important to just pause before we re- respond. Just pause and connect with and connect with your needs. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> because I have nothing when, else to say. Well, and like when you get like a negative uh, comment, um, you have four choices. You can either blame the sender, uh, which is what Laganja did. You could blame the uh, you could blame the receiver, like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm bad, right? My bad. Um, mm-hmm. You could mm-hmm. sense your feelings and needs, which is what um, I would ask Laganja to do, or you could sense the other. Uh, the other's uh, feelings or needs, right? Um, And uh, number one or two are not going to be helpful, and that's going to lead to a violent communication interaction. But three Mm -hmm. and four are more likely to get to the root, to the cause of what's really going on. Mm. (laughs) Like, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. I get it. We're we're, we're having this, this like soaking the information in moment. Yeah. Pulling in examples. Where, where can, has this happened in, in our own life? Uh, How, how do you affect it? How to do it? It's, it's taking a moment of, of contemplation and, and mind uh, uh, is, is currently in the process of computing and hasn't finished its results right now. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So like um when we're when we are talking about our feelings, that's where the needs come in because our feelings are in direct relation with our needs, right? Because we have feelings because of a need that we that is not being met or is being met. Um and I also uh sent to Gary the needs inventory. So sometimes people don't know what their needs are. Uh, mm-hmm. so also really important because if you're having a feeling you have to identify or i'm asking you (laughs) to identify (laughs) the need that is at the root of that feeling right so like an example is um with fifi o'hara and sharon needles right when fifi was like criticizing um sharon for uh her goth outfit sharon could have responded to her and said fifi when you say that my outfit looks like goth trash I felt sad because I have a need for validation. Mm. That's some like hmm. next level shit. <laughs> <laughs> My observational judgment is saying that's some next level shit. Like, and that's not to be judgmental of like drag queens and communication methods. Like that's just some higher thing to be able to express that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Again, not something that we're taught. We're not taught these things in school. A lot of families don't, don't, you know, they don't model this behavior for us. Um, so what ends up happening is we get hurt. And what happens when hurt, what, what do hurt people do? They hurt people. Mm-hmm. So I think Fifi is a very hurt person, <laughs> is what <laughs> I think. And what happens no. when you communicate aggressively? You're either going to get respond to in an aggressive manner or you're going to get a passive response from somebody else. Mm-hmm. And then the other important thing with needs are if you don't communicate your needs, you're you're not likely to get them met. True. And if you don't know what your needs are, well, then, you know, like, what are you doing? Right. I mean, that, there's if you're unable to communicate needs, you're you're making a, a whole series of presumptions. The most significant one is that they already know what they are and they just aren't fulfilling them. Ding, mm-hmm. ding. And that's one of the issues that I think most people have. Yeah, they just they don't understand. 
like, and this becomes more apparent, uh, or you understand this better if you interact with someone who has limited communication skills. So, for instance, in our life cycle, in the years after we're born, and then the years before we pass away, if you quote unquote live a, a standard arch of like your life cycle, in the beginning, you're learning everything. So you don't have communication skills, effective communication skills, I guess I should say, like in terms of like verbalizing and explaining things. So, you know, babies cry, babies, you know, wail. They do things to try to communicate because they haven't uh, developed the verbal acumen of our style of communication. When mm -hmm. you get older, and I think of this with my father because I'm seeing him every day and assisting him with things, if your cognitive, you know, uh, abilities are changing, you may not be able to say things the way you mean to say it in the moment. Like all of that can affect your style of communicating and therefore also like affect your needs because you're not mm. able to clearly explain what it is you need in that moment. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, yeah. It, it, and I think if you have, those experiences it's a little easier to understand but the needs aren't being met if you if you can observe it like kind of remove yourself from the situation and take a look and as opposed to being you know so engaged or you're kind of tunnel focused and you miss that um and i, I know i see that a lot because i'm i'm a bit of an observer so like not right now but previously in public i would see like parents with children and parents would not be paying attention to the child so then the child starts trying to use any method possible to get the attention, like to communicate, which usually turns into mom, 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 yeah. mom. mommy, mama, mama. Penny, Penny, <laughs> Penny, Penny. Yep. Exactly. Was that a big bang reference? It was. Yes. Okay. I was like. The only reason why is because my father went through a phase. He hasn't been watching recently. He was watching Big Bang Theory in syndication nonstop. Oh. <laughs> like <laughs> daily. All oh, the time. God. And I never really watched it. I was aware of it like as a pop culture thing. And then while I was over, I would see parts of episodes. And over the course of the run of the show, I was like, so is Penny a slut? Like, did she sleep with everybody? And I realized, like, that's highly judgmental, but she had several different boyfriends, I think, amongst the group of them. Like, not to call her a pass around party bottom, but my goodness, like, <laughs> pass around. Totally, I, think party only, I think she only was with Leonard. If I'm, if I, but I haven't seen. I'm, I'm one of those like passive. I don't watch it all the time, but I watch. I mean, let me let me rephrase. I do watch it often, but not like. I didn't watch the series. I'm one of those, like, I'll catch, like, episodes on TBS, like your father, and just be like, oh, here's some episodes. And here I am watching, like, <laughs> back, oh. to back to back to back to <clears throat> back. Yeah. All I know is uh, about Big Bang Theory is that Dr. Mayan Bialik uh, played Sheldon's girlfriend. Yes. yes. That's about it. Yeah. And Sheldon is the only person I even know the name of one of the main characters of. <laughs> <laughs> like i mean it's it was good i mean it is amusing it is funny like in a nerdy way like it, it was kind of a phenom in a, in a very interesting way that it like communicated nerd concepts like and science and stuff in different ways that people like the lay public may not be aware of so it was a, i think an effective communication style of like unintentional things that people would you know understand um about social dynamics and just all sorts of things. But yeah, like I started paying attention, like, cause I can't, cause it, cause, and then the, when they're showing it in syndicate, it's not in the correct timeline. So like we'll watch one episode and then you'll watch the next episode and the next episode is like four seasons later. And I'm like, wait, I thought they were living together. And I thought she was dating him. And I don't, and I'm like, oh, I'm <laughs> like yeah, they don't always show him in the, in order. <laughs> Ugh, that is frustrating. That so it, it, it really made me think like, okay, like she's, you know, and for us old people, to guy to guy. and for us old people, we 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 can have our mind blown that Blossom ends up being a very intelligent <laughs> girlfriend. Of nerds. Yeah, 
Anyway, moving right along to the topic of the show. So, <laughs> so just to kind of uh, kind of review what we just said. So, um, be responsible for your own feelings, um, and that nobody can make you feel anything. Just like you can't make anybody else feel anything. Mm-hmm. Right. Like one of the that, that we should have is the idea of like emotional liberation so that, um, you know, we could be in a place of emotional slavery saying that like, I'm responsible for your, your feelings and you, for your feelings. And, um, and then once we realize that like, oh, you know what? I'm not, no, I'm not responsible for your feelings. I'm going to become a brat. Um, but the <laughs> idea that, um, that like, you know, uh, that we get liberated from that so that we are, we're responsible for our own actions and our own intentions, but we're not responsible for other people's feelings. And mm. we can't meet our own needs at the expense of others. True. Sure. Right. So um, behind those feelings and those needs, we want to make requests from other people, right. From, uh, from our partners, our, our, um, our spouses. Right. So like, here are the do's and don'ts of making requests. Do, um, it's all about the framing. How you frame it is going to uh, uh, make sure that you're going to get what you want or what you need. Um, do use the word do uh, and be specific. Don't use the word don't. Uh, I'm looking at you, Rue. So, like, and don't fuck it up. Uh, and can see this like, and do a great job. Exactly, right? So, like, um, one thing that uh, I have seen this past couple of weeks are people saying, don't panic. Well, now I'm going to panic. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> do remain calm. <laughs> right? Like, positive, <laughs> positive language. Um, so you're saying a- the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is wrong. Why? Because the big thing is, don't mm. panic. <laughs> oh, yeah, because now I'm going to panic. It's like a, ah! like a well fulfilling prophecy. Negative language creates anxiety. Um, ah. And it tells me what not to do, not what to do. So, like, another example of that is our growler profiles. One of my biggest pet peeves is when they only have lists of what they don't like. Mm. I don't care about what you don't like. I care about what you do like, right? So when you're making a request, tell me what you want, not what you don't want. So, like, to quote the Spice Girls, tell me what you want, what you really want. Right, yep. like that's gonna that's yeah. gonna get me closer to what I what I what I what I want and what I need. Um, it's also important to make requests and not demands. Um, I mean, I think that goes without exp- uh, without explaining. Um, and then for the receiver of uh, requests, um, we want to make sure that we're clarifying their their requests if it's not clear to us. We want to make sure that we're paraphrasing it. So what I'm hearing you say is, and reflecting it back to them. Because that's gonna make that's gonna make them feel heard and understood. And then after you ask for a request, um, ask for some honesty. Ask for some feedback. How are you feeling about what I just asked? Mm-hmm. Is that a lot for you? Um, so, um, no, sister, I don't want to talk to you right now. Um, <laughs> see you're not uh, supposed to use the word don't <laughs> right I mean yeah um, I'm not saying that don't uh, don't get uh, don't say don't uh, at any time but um, you know so I, I think a better way to phrase it is avoid using the word don't yes I think that's that's the the challenge. Just like so something I've been hearing um this is something to consider Ed. in a bunch of the discussion today you've used the word hard often and the reason why I'm focusing on it is because many years ago, well not many years ago, quite a while ago, good decade plus, 
I was very much into a lot of self-help like books and speakers and stuff like that. And one of them said something really interesting. They said, be careful about the words that you use because you give them power. So when you say that things are hard, you're inferring that they're almost insurmountable. <gasps> but if you say that things are challenging or difficult, you use a different word, you are expressing that there is the opportunity or the option to move through or beyond. So it took me a long time, and I'm not like immune from it, but I think often when I want to say hard, I actually rewrite it and say challenging. Like, and I do it with work. Difficult. Like, yeah, it's difficult. Um, it's and it's just a slight change, but it's enough that I guess now it point it came out to me because throughout the course of today, I've been and I was I wasn't ticking away and keeping track, but after a while, I was like, that's been saying hard a lot. Like, and it's not that you remove it from your vocabulary, because trust me, everybody likes it hard. Well, most people do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I always think of hard that's different. as in like hard mode where. It's going to be a challenging experience, but so I don't know. I think hard's a final word. I think it's okay. Yeah. I mean, I think reflectively, like if you're talking about hard versus soft, that's fine. But um, I think that people psychologically, the way it was explained, and I agree with it, you may not like the wall is hard, like almost impenetrable is, is like, like what subliminally comes through in that case. So it's just something like observationally. I, suppose, I don't know why yeah, I could I suppose have saved it for the show, but anyways. Yeah, I, t I suppose it's a, a a perspective thing because you're thinking of hard as in hard as a rock, well, uh, versus soft, hard versus soft. I'm thinking of more of like hard versus easy. There's, it's kind of two different, but similar uh, <laughs> uses of the term hard. So I think no, in gamer terms, you're thinking about physical object terms. No, I'm so I, I'm totally with you, Gary. Uh, and thank you for that feedback. That that's no, I think that's really important. Well, I mean, it, it's kind of like um, thinking gamer terms, not the physical universe. Well, I guess I would look at it this way. Um, like I have a tendency to think of things in terms of problems and solutions. Yeah, like 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 life is a puzzle things are to be resolved like so but that's my programming like that's the way i view things so when people present stuff as insurmountable um you know that it is it, you know there is no there is no possibility of resolution it cannot be fixed i don't mm -hmm. usually accept that i think okay well perhaps there's a different way to go about this a different perspective mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, and I may not know what that is. Like, um, here's a uh, revealing kind of operational thing. So let's see. This is 2020. In 2019, I went through like my personal kind of dark journey of the soul in terms of like some severe depression. And during that, one of the things that I kept kind of reminding myself that kind of I was saying to myself in my own internal dialogue is that this is not forever this is temporary this will move beyond as the as often people say this too shall pass like yeah. i i had but only because i had been through some stuff in my past was i already aware of that cognitively that i was able to kind of give myself that personal internal dialogue to be like in this moment i feel crippled i feel like you know ineffective unworthy but i was also recognizing in that very moment like this is okay like this is an expression of a feeling this is like i'm owning it in this moment but it's not going to be forever that's very challenging and very difficult though because emotion can be completely overwhelming and you uh, can't like you cannot see the the other side of it you know it's kind of like i really want ice cream right now and i don't have ice cream well, that's not going to be the state forever. Most likely you're going to get ice cream. Like you could actually put some clothes on, grab the money, like whatever's going to be the transactional currency and go get some. Or you could that's make some. convenience store right down the street. Fine. That's like hard. I have to actually do stuff. No, no, it's not hard. Go, like, it's difficult. 
I have to like actually put on clothing and like actually get in my car and actually go to the store. And, no. <laughs> yes, April. I am wearing <laughs> pants. I am wearing lounge pants. That's enough. I just maybe throw in a sweatshirt because it's a little chilly out. Correct. So, and and all of that is valid. It's just a. It's a it's a perspective, I guess, is is what it is. That was one of the key things I learned many years ago with a a client that we had that actually focused on um, cognitive behavioral uh, ideas of how to handle anxiety and depression. And mm-hmm. I thought it was, like mind blowing because having to work on that program, um, it was effectively sales, but like you needed to be able to walk in and talk it, like you needed to understand it. Mm-hmm. It it does things like if you think about, you know stuff from that that standpoint but it is it, it's it's it requires a lot it requires focus it requires attention um mm-hmm. and commitment and that's therein lies the challenge that's where people think i may not be able to achieve this so i and you're probably fully engaged in this i guess in, in terms of couples therapy it's like well let's not talk about the goal let's talk about like something that we can do to work towards the goal. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it's, it's very much about the process, right? Like, cause Gary, you were talking about like problems versus solutions. Again, another, um, thing that, that we're learned to do, like, you know, as a healthcare worker, like I want to get to the solution, <laughs> right? Like yeah. I, I don't like problems. Um, but like sometimes like when we're talking about empathy, sometimes we have to sit in that problem, <laughs> And that's shitty, <laughs> right? And like something that doesn't feel that uh, that doesn't always feel good, um, or that doesn't always feel comfortable to not use a um, an evaluative word. Um, and sometimes we really have to kind of take in what people are saying, um, nice. and that like sometimes th- like they don't need a solution, right? Like sometimes what they need is just to be heard. Uh, mm-hmm. to be understood right um and you know i have i'm so i'm very guilty of this um of moving too quick to the solution right like so i will ask people before i do anything well what can i do for you right now or um uh what would you like from me Right. Do you want me to just listen? Do you want my advice? Do you want my experience? Do you want like, you know, how can I help you in this moment? Um, And that definitely takes some practice, too. Sometimes all people want is a hug. Right. Or silence. Silence is really powerful. Uh, You know, like people say, wow, you're a really good listener. I didn't say anything. (laughs) Right. I didn't say anything. I just sat there and nodded my head. And they leave, uh, they leave, wow, that was a really great session. Good, I'm glad, because I feel like I didn't do anything. But <laughs> your perception is that, like, I was, I held that for you. Um, right, well. I didn't try to solve, I didn't try to, um, I didn't try to change how you felt, because um, that's not my responsibility. Um, right, I, I mean, you're effectively holding space with them. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things uh, that, takes time like uh and considerable effort in that moment so, like i know because what you're talking about it was funny because i was like oh i guess that's maybe how i should communicate things but i don't because when people come to me <laughs> with something and i see it as a problem and it needs a solution my go-to is to give them options like to immediately be like have you thought about this did you consider that have you looked into this and i've had to say to my closest dearest friends like if you don't want me to help you, you have to tell me. Mm-hmm. That's my default. So if Damon comes to me and is concerned about something, I'm immediately moving mentally into, okay, well, how do we how do we fix this? Like, or how do we resolve it? How do we how do we get to a solution? Have you considered these different options? And if you don't say to me, I just need you to listen. I don't need your input. I don't mm-hmm. want your assistance. I need you to just be here for me. Like if you don't tell me that stuff, I don't know that. Like yeah. I, yeah. I don't I don't pick up on it. I go to, you know, my default. And I, so I mean, every once in a 
Blue Moon, someone's, you know, been good and well, that's kind of evaluative, but they've they've learned from my saying that to them that they've actually said, I just need to vent. So no offense. Shut up. <laughs> just listen. <laughs> Yeah. And like, do that. Right. Like, that's what that sometimes that's sometimes that's what I need. Like, if I'm not in my office, um, like, like I'm just going to audit like Gary, like you were saying, sometimes I'm going to automatically go to problem solving mode. And yeah, sometimes that's not what people need. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes people don't even know what they need. So like, sometimes our job can be to help them identify what they need in that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Because like, here are some words to look out for frustrated and upset. Frustrated and upset does not tell me how you feel. It tells me that you don't know how you feel. It says that you're kind of confused. But does it that therefore actually tell you something? It, It gives you a clue um, but like, it doesn't really, it, it may say that I'm having difficulty processing this information and I'm having a, uh, I'm having an, an emotion about it. I just, I don't know what it is yet. So like when people tell me, wow, I'm upset. So are you, are you sad? Are you hurt? Are you angry? Mm-hmm. Are you frustrated? Frustrated. That to me tells me that you don't know how you feel yet. Mm-hmm. Correct. I, I I guess by this is part of me when someone tells me that they're frustrated, I accept that. I don't try to go further because I understand that. Like frustration is usually an impassable moment because like all other methods or words or concepts are failing them. Yeah, like it's well, it's sort of it's it's sort of well, a I see it as sort of a short circuit in the moment. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just. That's your red. Okay. So you, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like your, your your level of frustration may not be somebody else's level of frustration. Fair. Going back to the middle of thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, I, I think it. a lot of the times <laughs> you're a, you you end up getting angry because you don't understand. And that's where frustration kind of comes from or uh, things. I, yeah, it's, it's because of an, of understanding because things are short circuiting is is I'm feeling angry, which is usually where frustration kind of comes from is anger because but only because you're lacking something which is short circuiting what the current situation is. Yeah, you're lacking a need. A need's not being met. Mm-hmm. And that's. That, that is what anger is. It's our needs not being met. But, um, uh, and this is, like, remember when I said that, like, after reading this, I was like, oh, I was framing that wrong, that this model says that anger is, um, anger is more about your thoughts, not about the experience. Anger is a, um, you're evaluating a situation. Mm-hmm. That there is an emotion under anger that is the more probably accurate emotion that you're feeling correct my personal philosophy that i've adopted that i've seen repeatedly uh put out there over and over again is that anger is actually an expression of fear yes that it's actually rooted in in scarcity in fear in and which is most in most considerations deemed by this by this theory this philosophy it's about uh and like not being validated, like not being connected. But that's a that's some stuff that's really difficult when people don't have that idea. It's it's not something in their wheelhouse. It wasn't explained to them. Uh, as an example, one of my very best friends, we had a deep uh, conversation in a car in a driveway in a short period of time because they were talking about a difficult moment in their life and how they were struggling with something. And what I said to them was, I'm here for you and I understand that you're feeling scared in this moment because you're not feeling validated because you don't feel loved because that's what everybody's Mm -hmm. looking for. Everybody's looking for love. Everybody because love is an expression of acceptance that I recognize you and I and I, you know, um, hold you in a place. 
And they were like, what? Like they just, <laughs> they were really kind of thrown sideways because I completely changed the tone of the, of what was happening because they were, they were being very emotive in the moment. And I was like, and I didn't tell them to stop. I just like changed the, the, the concept in the moment and told them like, I firmly believe that everything is an expression of love. It's just, we change the messaging in a different way. So if we're feeling invalidated or not validated, that tends to come from a place of scarcity of fear. And that t has a huge potential to be anger or in some ways frustration, you know, it, it comes out in, in the ugly, you know, emotions as, as some people say, because we're worried that you're not seeing me, you're not hearing me, you're not validating me, like you're not recognizing me, you know, whatever that, that thing is. I said, and yeah. if you can, if you have that concept, if you think about it, if you absorb it, if, if like whatever you do with it, if you bring that back to the moment when someone's being upset and frustrated and angry and pissed or whatever, it changes things dramatically. And it could be a really effective, fast way to diffuse a situation, but it takes effort and work in that moment to say, so if Ed was if Ed and I were in the same space and he was expressing, you know, being angry about something, my role I would feel in that moment is to counterbalance like the pH of the situation. If I'm a base and he's being acidic, like how do I get us back to neutral? How do I get us closer to like an even situation as opposed to some volatility because he's upset about something? Yes. And you can even like, cause like when somebody's angry, like Gary, you were, yes, absolutely. Kudos. Um, cause like you want to focus on their, their feelings and their needs. So like, so like what need, like, so it sounds to me like you need this. Mm -hmm. Right. It sounds like, like scared. Fear is like the best one. Like, it sounds like you're scared of this. Um, what, like, what do you need? What, how can I help you? Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm so here for that. Help me help you. Help, help me help I you. Somebody. And, and that's, <laughs> you know, and, and I know one of my communication styles, which is not always effective, is to use humor. So yes. if Ed was being mad and expressing that, I have to be very careful because while I'm being compassionate, I'm not being effective because I might turn around and say something smart ass, like sarcastic in the moment. And it's like, I really think I'm feeling in this moment, Ed, that you really need a hug. Do you want just like an arm embrace or do you want a mouth hug? Like, where do you want to go with this? <laughs> I just want a mouth hug. <laughs> but, but like if you're actually, but if you're in pissosity and you're angry, that probably will not be effective. I don't because need that, that right because now. you could turn around and, and simply bounce it right back and reflect, you know, and retaliate and be like, you don't take me seriously. And you're always like, you know, making a joke of everything. <laughs> oh. Well, and like, and uh, to kind of go like, you know, if we frame anger as a evaluative, like, like thought. So like, if somebody says I'm angry, like you, your first thing could be like, well, what are you thinking about? Well, I'm thinking blah, 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 blah. Okay. And how does that make you feel? Or, or like, how are you feeling about that? Well, I'm feeling like blah. Okay. And what needs are you, like, what do you need? Um, so, yeah, absolutely. That can help really diffuse that situation too. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> but as you were saying earlier, and I don't want to, like, kind of beat this message, you know, horribly, a repetition for people but that's work it it's, is it's and it takes and it takes being present that's the thing i think mm -hmm. most of us as human beings are that's our biggest irresponsibility or challenge is being in the moment and recognizing like literally being in the moment to be able to do that work i think we we have a myriad of distractions and so many variables that we that we're not you know Paying attention to something. Yep. Our phone. Know number, do you know how many times I get into an argument with Jim because I'm I'm not paying attention because I'm on my phone? <laughs> that, my challenge. that was the that was one of the biggest fights and ends of a previous relationship I had. I was dating somebody, and 
smartphones devices were newer at the time and it was just an onslaught litany of like being distracted by stuff and we're sitting together on the love seat in his living room at his place the tv is on his dog is there like there were so many distractions already but i had just like completely absorbed myself into the device and he was having a high quality movement with me and sharing things but i wasn't focusing and paying attention so i did the classic thing that you're not supposed to do when he kind of got towards the end and he was like, you know, and what do you think about that? And I was like, well, I mean, I, I think, you know, that your feelings are valid. He's like, you weren't even paying attention. And I was like, and so I owned it <laughs> instead of going, well, of course I was paying attention. I actually said, you know what? You're right. I wasn't. Which then nope. escalated things. Cause then he got really mad because I actually owned it. Cause then he was like, instead of being, okay with the validation that he was right it's that he was even more angry because he's like he's like i just build my guts to you and you admitted you weren't even paying attention like, like, yeah thanks, yeah. thanks for not like being here and it was like well yeah yeah that's that that does take work yeah mm -hmm. and that's the difference hearing and listening mm-hmm um, and sometimes, like, I ask my need, my request is, can you make sure that I'm listening? But that's not his, his job. Yeah. You know, like, I sh like, not to evaluate myself, but, like, I, I should be more mindful. And I should make more of an effort to, to, to listen and not hear. Yeah. And I hope he's listening. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Um, but like, <laughs> I guess the final point on that is we need to know uh, what playground we're on. So like sometimes the library has to be closed, right? Like sometimes um, we can't be a critical Kathy or a Judge Judy. Um, and, we, you know, our job isn't to tell you about yourself, you know. Um, you know, sometimes we're, we're we just need to be here. And when that, mm -hmm. know when that time is right. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that's going to be new for some people. Um, like in the past couple of years, I've learned about spoons and I've learned about like holding space purely because people who are incredibly brave for being open about their like situation and specifically their mental health were forthright to explain their needs and that those methods, like those concepts, like the first aid uh, for mental health training that I'd gone to, I was one of the youngest people in the group. Well, that's not true. Most everybody was older than me. There were a couple of people younger than me that were in college, but I was pretty much the only person except for one other individual in a group of like 20 some people that even had heard of spoons or what it meant. So in that moment, I ended up explaining conceptually about the idea um, of what that is. Uh, so mm. it was it was it's good to pass things on, I feel like to share the education of that. Um, and one of them is that, you know, maybe you just don't get, you know, you don't engage like you would normally engage. Yet you're still there for them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are we ready to review? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, um, that was a lot. Uh, you know, so thank you for that. And, yeah, so that, that was a lot of information. Um, so just to kind of go over really important stuff, be specific, be, be specific, B-E-S-P-E-C, I-F-I-C, I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I ran out of letters. <laughs> <laughs> Be, be, be specific. Um, check. Make sure you're checking the assumptions or check the assumptions of others. Are we on the same page where we're talking about this issue? And am check the assumption of yourself. Am I feeling this way because of how I'm thinking? So yeah. kind of go back to the the cognitive triangle. Um, state observations without judgments. Identify. So no tea, no shade. Uh, all, uh, all feelings or identify feelings, not your thoughts, identify your needs and make requests 
not demands. Valid points. Yes. Um, and I got some resources here and some books. Um, I've referred to this book before, but opening up a guide to creating and sustaining open relationships by Tristan Terramino is a really good book. Um, I would refer that to anybody exploring, uh, you know, their relationship and maybe possibly make it more expansive. Um, and then a lot of the nonviolent communication stuff comes from work from uh, Mark, uh, he's a clinical psychologist, uh, he's deceased. But uh, I put two different books in there um, that have the, the the concepts and the process and some uh, some other good examples. Uh, my only my only note about that is uh, his work can be rather heter um, heteronormative or heterosexist. So, um, you know, you're not going to see a lot of um, a lot of diversity when it comes to relationships. Um, and then there is a, uh, a therapist by the name of Dr. Sue Johnson. Um, she came up with a, um, a therapy style called emotionally focused therapy. And there's a really good book that I recommend to some of my clients, um, called hold me tight, seven conversations for a lifetime of love. Um, that can really help make sure that you are, um, uh, like sustaining and improving the attachment that is within your relationship. Okay. Mm. All these will be linked uh, in the show notes. And if you want to see the notes to all of this, I'm just basically copying and pasting our entire notes. So uh, I know Lloyd uh, earlier was, was saying every, uh, what was the specific thing he said? It says like, Edward's episodes are so fucking educational. I feel like I should take notes. Um, <laughs> And then I let him know that the show notes are on the website. So you kind of got the notes already written out. So, <laughs> um, and that website, uh, because of the end of the show, oh, um, is cubsoutloud.com. And you can find everything, uh, all the show notes for any of our shows. Um, and, and so you can easily go back in time. I know our feed only goes back so far. So if you want to listen to even older shows, like some of the previous uh, episodes of Landscape of Relationships, besides going to the YouTube channel, you can also go to our website. Uh, you can shoot us an email. It comes out loud at gmail.com if you have any questions that we can bring up in possibly a future episode of this series. I don't know. <laughs> um, and do that. Uh, uh, it comes out loud at gmail.com. You can also leave us a voicemail. We'd love to hear your voice at C uh, 361 CML Talk. That's 361 265 8255. Uh, you can also follow us on uh, various social media outlets such as Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, and YouTube. It uh, comes out loud in the appropriate place of the URL. Uh, you can join our entourage chat and chat us up about uh, whatever you want, uh, whether it's about the show or not, uh, at tinyurl.com slash telegram dash col. If you would like to know when we're planning to schedule these shows and what topics we're planning on doing, as we had from last week where we switched topics, uh, which is fine because it was appropriate, uh, you can find that at tinyurl.com slash calendar dash col. You can get various merchandise such as now that you're sticky, here's your cookie shirt that both Gary and I are wearing. Not intentionally that we were going to wear it all the same time. <laughs> that was not intentional. I just grabbed a shirt. I intentionally wore it because I thought it was a great communication, like example. So you want to get sticky? Well, no, it's just it's it's effective. It says now that we're sticky, here's your cookie. So Ed doesn't know where <laughs> this comes from. It's from years <laughs> ago, but there was a whole very humorous moment in which it was a reward system for once you know the orgasm had been achieved that you would give the person a cookie. So. Anyways, uh, <laughs> or you can get a hat like Gary is wearing. There's various other accoutrements at Zazzle.com slash uh, Cubs Out Loud. Uh, and uh, once again, there are also other country stores at Zazzle. So you can go to Zazzle.co.uk, Zazzle.de. Or you, uh, if you go to Zazzle.com, just scroll down to, to the bottom and there's a place where you can change your country. And you'll be able to see the prices in your local country. And I believe they ship locally. So a lot cheaper than trying to get something from the United States. 
if you're not in the United States. Um, you can also become a patron. We appreciate all you patrons uh, at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. And again, you can hear our talk about Broadway HD from uh, uh, before pre-show and whatever the post-show ends Ooh. up being. Um, if you become a patron <laughs> at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Uh, also, you can rate us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe to us on Google Play Podcasts, and Spotify. You can find me anywhere in the internet. It says box that box, puppy box, cup box, something or other. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, you can find me as Theater Cup 79 on most bear related sites, or as pup underscore umbra on Twitter. If you would like to get in touch with me, I could pretty much found anywhere online as GareBear73. If you want to um, be distracted during your self isolating quarantine phase with what replaced Tumblr, you could uh, <laughs> request to follow me on Twitter at GareBear73XXX. And you can find me on Facebook uh, under Edward Angelini Cook. Um, I'm on Instagram as Unicub underscore Sex Brain Wizard. Um, and on Twitter, um, my regular thing is uh, Eddie H. Cook. Um, but uh, for some more interesting content, you can go to Jeep Daddy 3. Um, I just asked no family members. Thank you. Jeep, Jeep, Jeep Daddy 3? Yeah. Yeah, Jeep, like the vehicle brand, not cheap. Like as a, <laughs> that's, what the, see, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm not, it is I'm in not the cheap. dock. <laughs> you can you can see it for yourself. In any case, uh, just one wanted to confirm one thing. This was a great one where you can find. There we go. Mm. Where you know? Hey, and also, uh, say good night, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hey, everybody. Have a good one, y'all. <laughs>